Well, some things inevitably follow the others, and Pea Ridge inevitably follows Wilson's Creek, as in the magazine, uh, which has been a long time since I've been able to read, uh, that came with Wilson's Creek. They gave a lot of the story leading through Wilson's Creek into Pea Ridge, etc. Um, this is titled by them the Gettysburg of the West, SPI that is. It's no Gettysburg. This isn't really the West. This is the Trans Mississippi over in, in uh, you know, Missouri and Arkansas um, region. And in the sense that it is the climactic battle, which determines that, uh, you know, the Union is going to hold uh, all of Missouri, basically. And between this and Wilson's Creek, they kind of uh, handle that. Now, the government of, of Missouri before Wilson's Creek has already capitulated to the Lions. And now this is significantly later. What is the year on this? 1862. It's another year later. We've got a lot of the same characters, though. Now you can see the actual board setup is pretty simple. There's only one unit on the board. This uh, one union... Mm, what? Independent Infantry Missouri State Guard on the Union side of the State Guard. Uh, actually, that may be a regular unit. I'm not sure. Anyway, but there are a lot of reinforcements coming on. And what we're basically going to see, it's been a long, long time since I played this, and I played it a lot less than Wilson's Creek, so I don't really remember it too much. But hey, we got a round top. Uh, we've got definitely thick, hefty terrain to deal with here. Of course, not as much underbrush as there was in Wilson's Creek, but we do have uh, both light woods and heavy woods. The heavy woods and the light woods is the pale green. That's a large effect on this. We also have some elevation levels, but elevation doesn't play the kind of it, it, it's not detailed in the same way that it was in uh, in Wilson's Creek. And actually, this feels almost TSS-like in terms of the board. You can see much, much cleaner coloring, etc. Much less on it. On, uh, I don't know what I was saying. Okay, so let's see about the light woods. Light woods is almost like that brush. You can sight through a hex. It gives some column shifts against, as does the heavy woods. Movement-wise, a little bit of penalty. It's really very much like the brush, uh, but maybe a little thicker because of, at least in terms of the distance effects. We're using the same scale and same gunpowder tables. Uh, none of them are on here. Oh, no, here we go. Here's the range effect. Uh, yeah, do they look the same? Yeah, I think they're the same tables. Um, some Union cult repeaters. Confederates have some shotguns. We get some pistols. Uh, let's take a look at the specific rules, but let's also uh, let's take a view of what's going on here because I haven't really looked at the entry hexes. So the Union comes in on 0123 and 0115, which is going to be from here and here. Pushing in from this side. I'm guessing this guy's probably facing the wrong way. Uh, let's take a quick look for them. 3906, 3946. There's 3946. Yeah, we definitely want to be there. And 3906 has to be up here. Uh, we've got the Confederates coming in with two big divisions, basically. McCulloch who's coming in from up here, and Van Dorn coming in from down here. Now, Van Dorn is ill, and we'll see the effect of that on it. The Union is coming in uh, with a bunch of divisions. Remember, Union divisions tend to be small. Uh, no higher hierarchy, as it were. Just divisional commanders uh, that you have to keep um, the, uh, the commands under. And if you look, 
there aren't a lot of people under any given, so Carr, I think he has Dodge and Vandiver under him. Asboth has Schaefer, and that's it. Siegel has, yeah, Siegel from the other one, has Kohler and Busey. So we don't have a lot of uh, Union units having to trace, so there's going to be a lot more fluidity, I think, to the Union, how they can position themselves, etc. Of course, the Confederates are coming in with the good ground behind them. We have Victory Point Hexes uh, pointed out here. And somewhere or another, there's a whole uh, whole assignment of those. And like in the other one, infantry is worth one, basically, but captured are worth two. Same with cab. Guns, similarly, there are some different rules here with the artillery crew. Um, let's see, our hex is 2142. Where is that? Looks like this one. That's very heavily a lot of points if the Union holds it. Not so many if the Confederates do. Now, the way these are balanced out, you know, 10 points for one side, 50 for the other. I'm not sure why they did that. Uh, it's a 60-point swing, no matter how you look at it. There is no, that's not really controlled in the game, right? Yeah. The last person to occupy it. Everything's considered union control at the beginning. Uh, the opposite, this one, almost certainly going to be in union control. And then 0712 and 0713. Let's see where these are. Where are they going to be up here? Uh, Lee Town. Um, those are expected to be in union control as well. That's all the points tell you, but it doesn't really mean a damn thing, because they are. This is a 40-point swing each, this is a 60-point swing, this is a 60-point swing, and that's all they are. I mean, yeah, there, there's no need to look at them in any other way. Um, all right. In order to win the game, at the end, you'll see there's a night period, and that com complicates things a little bit. In order to win the game, at the end of the first day, you have to have 100 points and at least a 3 to 2 ratio over your opponent. And that's where kind of this works out, is they balanced them out with the casualties and said, okay, if you're doing that well, 3 to 2, yeah, that makes sense, whatever. Okay. Um, now, if you don't get it on the first day, on every even turn in the second day, you have to score at least 50 more points than your opponent. Uh, proportions no longer matter, and otherwise, if we make it to the very end without any of that happening, whoever has the most points wins. Uh, trouble with that? Well, we have to kind of keep a running total of points throughout the whole thing. Advantage for that? We got this sucker here, and you'll notice we're using the brigade combat effectiveness, and one of the factors here is that you get uh, victory points for knocking out Brigade Combat Effectiveness. Now, um, this works the same way as in TSS, which I think it was an optional rule, but I'm not positive. Uh, but maybe not, that's, I don't know. I can't remember what was optional and what wasn't in the old TSS. I'm sure in the later ones, it became part of the, the core thing. But it's very similar to what you see in the gamers uh, Civil War games as well. Hey, break the unit and you get some victory points on top of just the damage you caused. We track the ammunition on these. And by the way, I have, although I've used that, I have photocopies that I made long, long ago that I'll reuse instead of marking this up continuously. Um, and let's see what else we got here. Dodge enters detached. Well, I guess from a uh, car. Okay. Um, anything else I really wanted to touch on on that? Yeah. Okay, let's look at some of the specific rules for this one. Well, first of all, they rewrite the artillery rules. And this is one of the issues I have with this series. Is, you know, right from the very start, they designed the series... And the first two games, one of them threw out a handful of rules. This one rewrites a handful of the rules. It's as though they, you know, 
came to this, I, I think the system is designed by Berg, but you know, other people said, oh, no, 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 that doesn't work for my battle. So there's a lot of special cases in each one. Not that it's a huge deal. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of rules here. But each one's a little different in ways that somehow kind of aren't that sensible, like changing how you handle artillery crews. That's pretty standard. And this one uses closer to the base rules to the game. Um, Wilson's Creek doesn't mention it, but... It, introduces its own little special counters for it, for them, that are different from the counters used here. The counters used here are these, these are what the crews are going to be. They don't tell you who they belong to, though, and that's important because, again, in this game, you can't attach the crew to a random gun. It's got to be the gun it came from, and once you take half crews, you have to keep that counter with the gun. Weird stuff. Okay. Um... Artillery has to be in command in this one, and it's subordinated to brigade commanders in the case of the Union, divisional commanders in the case of the Confederates. Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, artillery depletion, handled under a new set of rules on this one. Hey, I don't even remember how these work. I didn't really look at them, and I can't seem to find them. But it's on a per game turn basis as you go deeper into the game. The chances of a depletion increase. And again, the Confederates have less ammo on board. Uh, the Union has a couple of supply wagons. A couple of the brigade leaders have supply wagons. I assume they can be captured. Uh, but I'm not sure. You could capture them in Wilson's Creek, but you couldn't use them. They had no ammo in them. Uh, okay. Uh, they increased the rules for out-of-command units, giving them a morale penalty in, in addition. Now, again, sensible, but damn it, this belonged over in the, the basic rules. Or it doesn't really belong in the game. Um, they came out with night rules, and this is scenario-dependent, and hey, you know, I mean, how many battles last a couple of days? A few, but maybe you can handle that specially in each case. Some of these seem pretty general, but okay. Uh, a withdrawal interface, forces have to kind of pull back from each other. That's pretty standard. Night movement, uh, turns are longer, but then they give longer marches to them so that it doesn't have the same suppression uh, of activity that, say, the gamers' games have, but okay. It also gives a straggler recovery chance. This was introduced in uh, TSS as an optional rule, where, hey, some of your losses come back every night. Fair enough. And then a recovery of brigade combat effectiveness. And what this is... Oh, the withdrawal is if you uh, leave the map. Um, what is it? They... McCulloch was so beat up that he left the board. They come back on later. They're allowed to recover some of their brigade combat effectiveness, but they're not allowed to recover the actual stragglers because they've marched out of the area. Okay, well, the brigade combat effectiveness resets the amount of losses you need to lose effectiveness. So that could change the victory point standing at that point if you make it to the overnight standing. And it also it makes the, the units a little bit more capable of taking additional losses. In addition, they've taken their straggler recovery, so we'll see that as well. Um, specif specifying the retreats, no biggie there. You have to do that in every game, right? Well, maybe. Uh, so now, brigade combat effectiveness is not handled completely in the original series rules. It's kind of said, well, you mark them off and uh, what happens happens according to the exclusive rules. So they have to do that specifically in each case here. And in this case, uh, they do very much what seems to be the standard TSS rule. You pull back. Uh, if a unit routes when it's brigade combat ineffective and it's in command, the rest of the unit that's in command falls back. It's a, it's a good system. It, it, uh, gives a different feel, though, than from the, the gamers. So in the gamers' games, you can't continue an attack. If you're playing with defensive orders, it's more similar to this. Uh, I actually like the defensive orders better, so I kind of like the way these rules work, which is you can't hold ground once your unit is just demolished. 
but certainly uh, I think Dean actually came out and said he wasn't in favor of defensive orders even though um, they were put in I think every set of the rules eventually um, but in most scenarios or in most of the battles they say ah oh, don't play with defensive orders units need to defend well I kind of like the way they were but uh, okay uh, so now here we have, and this is also vaguely covered in the basic rules, this, um, we have green units, which have some specifics here, but you'll be rolling on this seeing the elephant table to determine their morale. They start out with a question mark morale, and you kind of got to mark it down on the sheet. You don't have it on the counter, so it's going to have a pin in the butt that way. Uh, a lot of record keeping, a lot of paying attention. One of the reasons I didn't like this as much as Wilson's Creek, but I've gotten more used to keeping track of uh, losses and everything on paper since then. Um, it's possible for units to have really crappy morale, so bad that they automatically fail. Basically a morale of one with a, a penalty against them. We'll never succeed in a morale check. That's fine. Uh, reinforcements very specifically in this game come in as a column of troops. Uh, that's important because the first unit that enters in the hex makes the next ones uh, pay. Hey, common sense stuff that should be there. Um, okay, Confederates. The Confederates aren't able to melee without a leader being around, basically. Um, if they don't have a leader around, they need to roll a one. If they have a leader adjacent to them, he can say, yo, go forward. They need a one or a two in order to, to enter melee. If they have a leader stacked with them, they can do it automatically, with the exception of Van Dorn, because he's lying in a wagon. Um, he gives them a one or a two. He can order them to melee. Now, this, I think, is part of this intention to try to cause Confederate casualties. The game uh, among the leaders. The game does not, uh, I, I don't think there's kind of this idea that the Confederates wouldn't melee without a leader, but there was this policy or doctrine of charging with the leaders at the front. I'm a little disturbed by the way it goes, but they work it in with Confederate leader losses don't come back right away. They took such heavy, severe losses to the leadership in this battle that it became hard to find replacement leaders. So there's kind of this die roll and you see how many turns it's gonna take for your replacement to come in and your units out of command, just kind of milling about during that time. Um, okay, union leaders work as normal. The Confederates have some Indians or Native Americans, if you'd prefer. Uh, this is under Pike, who's here. He's got Stan Dwady and he's got Drew here. Low morale, one morale units, armed with muskets, kind of suck. They have one additional rule. When you fire artillery at them, they got to make a morale check. Well, they almost always fail morale checks. So if you can pull more artillery into their range and just plink at them, they're going to break from the field. Now, they don't just keep running. They keep coming back. <laughs> but you can keep throwing some, some uh, grape shot at them and they'll, they'll take off again. Um, Van Dorn's ill health, he's going to be uh, unable to move. He's not on a horse, so he's moving at wagon rates, and he's only got 10 movement points. He's also got the inability to really lead in, in melee. Um, the designer's great-great-grandfather. We're not playing with this. It's a sort of humorous little piece in here. Apparently, uh, Eric Lee Smith's great-great-grandfather was in the battle, and if the unit he's with takes casualties, you roll a die, and if he's killed, well, you can't play anymore because the game was never designed, right? Somebody could have designed it. Uh, but maybe you get to change the rules. <laughs> Go back to pure series rules. I don't know. Uh, no, we're just going to ignore that. Okay, uh, we've pretty much hit the victory conditions here, and that's about it. Anyway, I have very little opinion on this game as of right now. I've played it a few times, but I don't remember it terribly well. Uh, Wilson's Creek really sticks in my mind. I know I purchased this somewhat later than Wilson's Creek. I don't remember quite when or how I got a hold of this. Uh, I'm pretty sure I bought it new. 
but I don't know if I bought it straight from SPI a couple of years later or if I, uh, well, it couldn't be too many years later, um, maybe I found it at a KB, maybe I, I, I found it at a used store but in new condition. I know that I punched the counters though and I, it's in terrific condition actually compared to my Wilson's Creek because I played the hell out of Wilson's Creek. Uh, anyway, up this goes and well, I hope I have fun with it. I don't remember, I remember sort of, uh, I remember playing both with my ex-wife and she loved Wilson's Creek and I don't think she got as much of a kick out of this one. Uh, the the chaos and, and the attack in Wilson's Creek was just so exciting to her. And also the control over where you're going to be hitting from. In this one, it's very much pre-plotted in terms of, you know, one side comes in from one place, one from the other. This does develop kind of nicely, though, in sort of, I, I would assume, sort of a, a, a Gettysburg-type situation where you can see a lot of Confederate troops coming in early, and then this slow tide of Union troops. And what about quality? Morale rating looks pretty decent for the Confederates. This is not a, a weak army, and the Union even better. So this is, oh, those are artillery. Nah, the Union doesn't look. Oh, these are all question marks. No, the Confederates Confederates have some decent units, but largely it's, yeah, it's largely stuff that's going to roll. I'm looking at the artillery. The artillery is fine, and the Union's even better. But, yeah, the Union looks like a professional army. The Confederate army, you're going to be rolling a lot of those units, and you got the Indians. So, yeah, maybe not quite a, a Gettysburg here because the Confederate leadership... And, and troops are definitely of lower quality, I think, than what you saw going into Northern Virginia. All right, up it goes.